So, Steve Jobs died last night, and I found out while I was actually sitting in graduate school, which is odd, as I'm a professor, a tenure-track professor at Ball State University, and I decided to go back and get a second master's in media arts and science and human-computer interaction. And people have asked me why I've done that, because it's not something that professors generally do. And the fact is, from the time I was a kid, I've always been fascinated with computers. And I grew up in a time when this wasn't really a profession. Um, and so today, as I was thinking about what I was going to tell my kids, what I was going to tell my students about the passing of Steve Jobs, I, it was apropos to me that I found out that I was that it had happened while I was sitting in graduate school learning things that I probably would not have been interested in had it not been for Steve Jobs. And it's even more interesting because for most of my professional career at Wired at MIT out of Technology Review, I um, wrote about and was not supportive of and continue to not be supportive of many of the business practices that Apple has engaged in over the years. But that's not the story that I wanted to tell my kids today, because the story was something bigger than that. So people have asked me what I told the kids because I've been tweeting about it most of the day. And I spent, I woke up this morning, um, and I've been in tears most of the day, which is odd for me. Um, and it was, and I, in all of my classes, I was in tears as I tried to explain to them why. And even last night, as Columnists and, and friends of mine who are writers would tweet and email me and ask me, what do you say? They were trying to figure out what they should say about Steve Jobs passing because it's so monumental. It's such a big deal for technologists and people that have existed in the world of technology that nobody that I know could easily sit down and say, "Here's this is what it means, right? Because it's too big. And I always tell my writers, whenever you get stuck with something that's too big, it means that you need to think really small. And so this is the story that I told my kids today. I got my first computer in 1984, and it was just a few months after the, the commercial um, that Apple put out on January 22nd. And I don't know if my parents, if that influenced my parents. Um, I had started tinkering with the Commodore Pet at my school, thanks to my um, math teacher and friend, and now family friend, um, Steve Ball, who just retired. Um, he, had re he had built these Commodore pets that, that we could use in class, and really, I was, the, I was really the only one that, that came in. There was a couple other kids, but I came in at every break, um, and my parents saw that, and I, I think they probably saw the commercial, and my uncle used the computers at Procter & Gamble, and so they bought me a Commodore 64, and I am I know my dad has told me years later they didn't know why they got it for me, but they they just knew that it was important. So as a 12 year old, they give me this computer and they put it in front of me and they give me a modem and they go upstairs and that's they don't I was I lived in the basement, um, which at the time was not a big deal. They had redone the basement. This was before the whole internet like troll live in the basement thing. I actually lived in the basement of my house. Uh, and I, you know, put the computer together and got it hooked up to the, to my 1200 baud modem. And uh, Steve taught me how to dial into these things called um, BBSs. People would have their computers and you could dial directly into their computer and leave messages and if you figured out the phone system you could dial into like your local library and then tunnel out to the library in downtown Cincinnati and then tunnel out to a library at University of Cincinnati and tunnel out around so for a local charge for calling a local number you could talk to anybody in the world and if you wanted to just dial directly into somebody's BBS you would incur long distance charges which as a 12 year old I did and so they gave me this computer and and it doesn't seem like a big deal today but I was a, a kid in Appalachia and uh, we lived in the middle of nowhere 
and we lived in a big town. You know, there was about seven or 8,000 people that lived in Loveland when we got there. Uh, and my family was from a place where my dad um, was from a town of about 800. And, and they, his family had come from a place called Manchester, Kentucky, um, which is infamous. In fact, you can read about our family in Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Outliers. We are part two. We were the bakers. We were the people that um, pass along cultural heritage in a violent way. Um, and Manchester was the centerpiece of that violence. And if you look at Manchester today, it's one of the five most poverty places in the country. Um, it's the most obese county in the country. It has a high school dropout rate of somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 percent. Um, we lived in Loveland, which was a lovely, it was a lovely town. It was a great town. It was, there wasn't anything about my childhood that um, was bad. Uh, but I was in the middle of nowhere. And I had this desire to see other places. And I, from the time I was a kid, and that was weird where I was from. Um, and, you know, people didn't do that. And so suddenly I had this device that allowed me to, within weeks, I was talking to people in China and Japan and Germany and England and people all over the country and people who were interested in things like science fiction and storytelling and just information and understanding how things worked. And for a 12-year-old and a 13-year-old, the world that I lived in was a very small world in Appalachia. Um, there was not a lot of diversity. There was not a lot of um, art and culture in the ways that I would come to know it later. It was a good place. It was a solid place. And the people there are, to this day, are some of the best people that I've known. And, and, I, and I love them dearly. But I always wanted something beyond that. And I've been told that by people throughout most of my life, that they always knew that... Um, it just seemed like my eyes were somewhere else. And so having this device um, changed everything and took a world that was small and turned that into a small world. And it's really hard, and this is where I start losing it, it's really hard for people today to un and kids today to understand the power that that has and the way in which that's changed everything about the world. Um, you know, Malcolm Gladwell has written, and I've gone places and talked about this, and he makes arguments that, you know, social media and things like that don't change anything. And, and I feel very sorry when I hear those arguments because clearly this, these are not people that understand, who only view it in a certain way. Um, because my world changed forever because of that everything that's happened in my life since the day that I stepped out of Loveland has been because of this thing this computer and the people in the communities that I've met along the way and I can't even tell you the thousands of people that I've met throughout my life through this thing um a few years ago, I was in Prague and sent out a tweet, and a guy who used to work for me in Austin happened to be living there, and he came and we had lunch together. And uh, I was in London and sent out a tweet, and we put together a tweet up, and a bunch of people who I would just talked with online um, showed up. And we had such a great time. Um, in Budapest now, I have friends, and when I go there, I can send out a note, and people show up. Uh, Howard Rheingold, I will never remember this, um, but I first came across him when I was like 14 years old. Um, and years later, as I'm at Wired uh, and thinking about, and I'm beginning to work on a book that's now transformed into another book, um, and I, I flew out to his house, and uh, we hiked Mount Tam, you know, and I got to talk to a guy who, um, when I was a kid, I didn't know who he was. I just saw what he was doing online and, and um, you know, through the well and things like that and thought, okay, okay, that shouldn't have happened to a, a kid that lives in the middle of nowhere. Um, 
it wasn't like um, people that I knew went to college by and large. It wasn't like I came from a place where um, world travel was something that was expected. I mean, I've, I've lived in cities now and I've lived around, I mean, I've lived in San Francisco and I've lived in Boston and I, you know, done uh, traveled to most of the big cities in America. And there's a difference between the expectation that you have um, from if you grow up of, from farm people. It's just different. Um, and if you have an experience that you don't know. And so as I was trying to explain this to my kids about why I woke up in tears today and why this has affected me and will continue to affect me, um, I think for a really long time, is because he was part of this, Steve Jobs was part of this. Um, the first computer that I ever bought myself, which I, I have upstairs, is a Mac. It was the last Mac product that I ever owned. Um, I never, um, like I said, the business practice and the intellectual property stances and things like that, I just, I could never get behind. But he designed this world along with Robert Taylor, along with JCR Licklider, along with Vannevar Bush, um, Bill Gates, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, Bob Metcalf, like these people designed the world that we live in and made it possible for a kid in the middle of nowhere to live in a small world and to understand that what existed around me wasn't the entirety of what existed. I oftentimes tell my kids, we can't, you can't build a thing that you don't conceive of first and that conception process requires you to pull in stimuli from everywhere and what you make is so radically dependent upon the things that you get to experience and unless you've grown up in a place that's so remote and so cut off from everything it's really hard to understand the importance of that and not that everybody needs to do it not that everybody needs to get on the internet and experience it in the way that I did but I could and the days that I felt alienated, and again, I wasn't picked on. I was shortstop on a very good baseball team. Like, I, we, I, I, there was nothing about my childhood that mirrors so many, so many of the horror stories that you hear from geeks and nerds, particularly back in the 80s and 90s. Um, and yet, I still felt that sense of alienation about my science fiction and my Dungeons and Dragons and my. Um, predilection for the nerdy things and I could go and find people that felt that way um, and I didn't feel so alone and I felt like that would be all right but maybe the most important thing and, and I think maybe the reason that I've been affected by that because the, the thinking of me as a kid and thinking of the kids that existed um, in those kinds of regions uh, is hard um, but it also is more personal than that. I mean, part of the reason that I left MIT and that I left Wired was because I knew I wanted to come back to Appalachia in this region uh, because I know. I, I know. And, and so it was my responsibility to come back. Um, but the other thing that I think that I want the kids to know was that when people tell them that these kinds of mediums have no real relevance or that the connections that they feel are are not as real as what happens in in real life and the technology is alienating us from people the reason that i woke up this morning and have been unable to control my emotions is because would it not be for people like steve jobs not only would my life not be what it is but there's a good likelihood that i wouldn't be here um and not in a hyperbolic way this isn't a um, it's a story that I've told, but it's not a, uh, it's not for effect. It's not a story. Um, but when I quit drinking, I did much of my, as I've done much of my life, um, in public on Facebook and on Twitter. And I went through, um, the detox process and, uh, the insanity that comes with that and if you've ever known an addict um, who's come out of uh, that you'll know uh, what I'm talking about and if you don't I hope that you never do